okay, uh, we are on. So um, I'll give you a chance to ask anything you'd like at the end of this. Uh, I'm just going to begin talking a little bit about chapter 12 in the textbook, which which really focuses on obviously the central nervous system. That's the title of it. I have to say this um, just as a sort of a preface to this. This is wildly, wildly complicated and we could easily spend an entire semester just studying the human brain or uh, obviously longer than that. So, um, you know, it's my job to decide what to do for this course. This is like a survey course of A and P. We're studying different systems and we have to uh, do what we can to fit the amount of information we can into this short summer course, which is five weeks. That's crazy. So I'm what I'm gonna do, my intent for this central nerve, the rest of this nervous system bit is to sort of pick out um, it's a survey is what it is and i'm going to pick out things that i think are most important and most helpful for you to not only learn right now but to go on in your careers with knowing something about this business so without further ado i'm going to mention certain terms and i'll refer you to some diagrams in your textbook that will help you obviously come quiz day next week so the first uh, word or term that I want to, let me call it the whiteboard, that I want to write down is just the term of cephalization. C-E-P-H-A-L-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. This just basically refers to the enlargement of the brain structure, the enlargement of neural tissue, what you and I call the brain, um, and it's an elaborate development of the frontal lobe. It's also, uh, so I'm just going to write, the, it's, it's more complicated than this, but these are just key words to think about when you see this word. It's an enlargement of neural tissue, specifically in the head region, in the skull, when we are developing. So we use the term cephalization really as a developmental term for the brain in utero or, or when embryologically. So it's, it also um, refers to an increase in the number of neurons during this time. So what contributes to that enlargement, that elaborate development of the frontal lobe is also a massive increase in the number of neurons. And where all where cephalization comes from, all neural tissue in mammalian development basically comes from something called a neural tube. So when we are first developing as embryos, neural tissue embryologically develops first into something called the neural tube, and it's this hollow structure. Um, so this, the neural tube is an embryonic structure. I'm just gonna write that. And it's the, really the, the, the derivation of nervous tissue. It's the first structure actually made of nervous tissue. And this is what the brain and the spinal cord develop from. So I'm just gonna write that back to cephalization. So first we just have this hollow tube and then there begins cephalization at the end of that tube, the head, the head end of that tube. Now there's also three I'm not gonna write all of this out. I'm gonna refer you to a diagram. There's three primary brain vesicles during development. So I, right now I'm just gonna highlight and write figure 12.1 in the text. And if you, you, you can read, I encourage you to read the, the the literature in the textbook, the, the verbal format, but 
figure 12.2 pictorially basically says it all. And it shows us that development starts from a hollow neural tube and the anterior or rostral end becomes cephalized, enlarged. And then that enlargement takes on three bulbous shapes. They're called vesicles. And it's just the prosencephalon, which is the forebrain, the mesencephalon, which is the midbrain, and finally, the romb encephalon, R-H-O-M-B, which is what we call the hindbrain. So that diagram will, will just, if you read it left from right, A, B, C, D, E, it just gets more complicated as the brain structures develop embryologically. And then the primary brain vesicles just develop into secondary brain vesicles and certain very typical developmental procedures occur. So that prosencephalon becomes a structure called the telencephalon and diencephalon. And ultimately the telencephalon is going to become the cerebrum or the cerebral hemispheres of, uh, that's the big portion of the brain, the big sort of covering of the brain that you and I think of. When you think of the, an image of the brain, what you're thinking of is the cerebral hemispheres. The diencephalon, on the other hand, is a portion of the brain that is sort of buried deep below the cerebral hemispheres. We'll talk about these pieces, their functions, in a minute. And then the mesencephalon, metencephalon, and myelencephalon become mostly the brain stem structures. So just to give you a quick, um, and I, I, I'm not going to be able to do this justice, but if, if I draw a quick sort of picture of the, of the brain, with this being the front, the anterior, and this be, be, being the back, the posterior, the, the human brain kind of looks something like this. Um, from a lateral view, a side view. All of this business, that you and I think of it uh, when we hear the word brain, those are the cerebral hemispheres that develop from the telencephalon. And then that, di that diencephalon area is sort of buried deep in this portion of the brain. We can't really see it from the exterior surface. And then those mesencephalon, metencephalon, and myelencephalon are mostly brain stem structures, which are down here. That's brain stem structures. And then that cerebellum is back here. So I'm just going to write brain stem. And that makes up three major areas. There are three major areas of the brain stem. This would be the cerebellum. It gets its name because in Latin, cerebellum just means mini or small cerebrum. These are the cerebral hemispheres, all of this stuff up here. Well, we call it cerebrum or cerebral hemisphere, same thing because it's the right and left side. And then this area that I'm putting a star in, and we can't really see it from the exterior surface. This would be the diencephalon. That's a very simplified version, but it gives you, when you hear these words or you read these words, it'll give you an idea of where they're located. And finally, on that diagram, it talks about the lateral ventricles, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle. That's best pictured, if you want to picture it in your mind, on page 385 in your textbook, figure 12.3. The ventricles are just fluid-filled cavities inside of this tissue in the brain. So the ventricles are almost like these spaces that contain fluid. and they contain cerebrospinal fluid. If we have time, I'll talk more about them and the fluid toward the end of this, not, to, not even today, toward the end of this uh, central nervous system business. So that gives us a little bit of an idea what's going on. Now I'm just gonna uh, quickly jump to 12.2. That's developmental talk that we just did. So I'm gonna layer over this board and talk a little bit about 
cerebral hemispheres. I'll start with that. Those are the big, large areas that you and I think of when we hear the word brain, the hemispheres. So this stuff, I, I, it makes up 80 plus percent. I think it's about 83 percent of brain mass. So it's most of the brain. <clears throat> They're the big, what you and I call the right and left side of the brain, the hemispheres. So I'm going to define a few quick terms for you. G-Y-R-E, gyri. This word refers to the raised ridges on the cere cerebral hemispheres. You know that the brain, just from seeing images, the brain is not smooth on its surface. It's, it's bumpy, it's got grooves, it's got raised ridges, and the name of those raised ridges are gyri. That's plural. The word gyrus, R-U-S, that just means singular, if you're just talking about one of them. And this term sulci, S-U-L-C-I, it's also plural. These are the grooves that we find that sort of define the gyri. So the grooves, <clears throat> so when you look at the cerebral hemispheres, you'll see all of these lines. You kind of know what a brain looks like a little bit just from seeing photographs. Well, the grooves, the lines that I'm drawing are the sulci. The gyri or a gyrus refers to these raised ridges, these mass areas between the grooves. Okay. Sulcus would be singular. If you were just talking about one groove, it's spelled sulcus. And finally, fissures are just deeper grooves, larger, deeper grooves. Okay, so now there's, there's some cerebral hemisphere landmarks that are just generally good to know. Um, so I'm going to list the major ones that I think are best to know for you. The first one is the median longitudinal fissure. And it helps us sort of make a map on the brain if we know where some of these major landmarks are. So we know what a fissure is. It's a deep groove. The median longitudinal tells us what it is. That is the center seam of the brain, if you want to think of it that way. It separates the right and left halves. So this is a lateral view, a side view. If we were to look at a frontal view of the brain, you'd see this deep groove running down like this, separating left from right. And I'm not doing this backwards. This is not your right or left. We're talking about the person that you're looking at, their right or left. So the median longitudinal fissure is that thing that separates, I'm just gonna put right from left hemispheres. The central sulcus is the next landmark. We know what sulcus means, it's a groove, not quite as deep as a fissure. The central sulcus separates the frontal lobes from the parietal lobes. So I'm gonna write that out. Frontal and parietal get their names from the, the skull plates in which these areas lie underneath. <clears throat> so if I were, I'll go back to this picture up here. If we're looking at a brain, there's the cerebellum, here's the brain stem. This is anterior, this is posterior, front and back. <clears throat> that central sulcus is a seam that runs 
sort of right here that separates what you and I might call front from back. So anterior from posterior. So this one, median longitudinal fissure separates right and left. This separates it, what you and I might say front from back. And finally, the lateral sulcus. We know what it is, it's a groove. And lateral tells us sort of where it's located on the lateral sides of, so I'm gonna put located on the lateral sides of the brain. And this one separates the temporal lobe. I'll try to draw you a quick diagram. There's also great pictures in your textbook. That's supposed to be a T. Separates the temporal lobes from the parietal and frontal lobes. So if I were to do a quick cartoon picture, um, let's do this. I'll, I'll draw the same lateral brain facing this way. So this would be anterior, posterior. Here's the cerebellum down here. This lateral sulcus kind of runs at a horizontal here. So it runs this way. All right, um, those are the, the, the general landmarks that I want you to know about so that if, if I say, oh, it's located superior to, above, or lateral to, or um, inferior to a certain sulcus, um, you kind of know what we're talking about. So let's move on to just the cerebral cortex. So we're just start, sort of making our general way around the brain and getting some landmarks, mapping it out as best we can with the time that we have. So the cerebral cortex, this is, I tell students sometimes, it's, it's got a thickness to it. It's not super thin, but it's sort of the covering of the cerebral hemispheres. So the stuff you see from the outside when you look at or hold a brain, you're seeing the cerebral cortex. This is, or put a star, where consciousness exists. So I'm gonna write this not only the frontal lobe, but the cerebral cortex is what's most highly developed in humans. So it's where consciousness exists and it includes things like where we get the sense of awareness. That means sense of self, that you know that you exist in a certain place and time and you can think about yourself almost separating uh, your mind from your body sometimes if you want. So we get a consciousness and an awareness. It's also where we have sensations. It's the major area for our ability to communicate. So I'm going to write communication. <clears throat> Memory. Higher learning and understanding. So you can see this is this the super complex, most complex part of the brain. And finally, voluntary movement. Obviously, humans aren't the only ones um, that can do many of these things, but it is believed and quite likely that we are the most complex, uh, certainly of all mammalian species on the planet. So our brain uh, is the most complex structure. And, and as far as we know, evolutionarily, the most complex brain that's ever existed. 
in time. So within the cerebral cortex, we already defined gray and white matter. <clears throat> the street, cerebral cortex is all gray matter. And just in case you've forgotten what that is, gray matter is unmyelinated neuron cell bodies. That you should know for today's quiz anyway. Unmyelinated So it's a collection mostly of neuron cell bodies. There are, what that means obviously is there are no myelinated fiber tracts, no white matter. So I'm just gonna write that. No myelinated So no white matter is found there. The cerebral cortex contains billions with a B, billions of neurons. Um, just to give you an idea of how thick it is, it's, it's about uh, like something like two to four millimeters thick. So that's why I called it up here, sort of a covering of the cerebral hemispheres. And the cerebral cortex, because it's so convoluted, even though it's relatively thin, only two to four millimeters thick, it makes up about 40% of all brain mass. That covering. <clears throat> And here's something worth noting. This will tell you the function of gyri and sulci. So those raised ridges and those grooves that we see all over the surface of the cerebral cortex, they increase surface area. They are responsible. They triple the surface area of the cerebral cortex. If you don't really have an idea of what that means real quickly, if our brains were just smooth on the top like this, what those gyri and sulci do is they do this. Now, if you were to take the top line and stretch it out straight, it might be about this long. If you were to take the bottom line and stretch it out straight, it would be three times as long. That's what the, those gyri and sulci do, is they triple the surface area. <clears throat> I'm gonna just layer on a new board because I'm out of space, but I'm still gonna finish up with the cortex. So this is still under the cerebral cortex. All neurons in the cerebral cortex are interneurons. Now you know what that means. So they're not sensory neurons, they're not motor neurons. All in, this, in the cortex are interneurons. Even though we have areas in the cortex that we call motor areas and sensory areas, that doesn't mean they are specifically motor neurons or sensory neurons. They're just areas that interpret motor information commands and incoming sensory information. That's what that means. So remember that, that all neurons in the cortex are interneurons, even though we specify certain areas like motor, sensory, or association. All right. And now I'm gonna get more specific and just talk about different cortexes. The first one that usually starts with the most 
AMP books is the primary motor cortex. So this, now these are uh, subdivisions of that cerebral cortex. We're talking about specific areas of the cerebral cortex. Primary motor, motor cortex, first and foremost, um, I'll try to show you where it's located. If we look at another, this is all in your book, don't worry, and it's color coded in your book, which makes it really nice. So if this is a lateral view of our brain, this is the front, this is the back. The primary motor cortex is located right about here. And it goes down both right and left sides, by the way. I believe in your book, it's, it's a bright dark red. <clears throat> what the main function of this is it controls this area controls voluntary, just like the name says, it controls voluntary skeletal muscle movement. <clears throat> there are things called pyramidal cells and tracts that extend all the way down the spinal cord. So I'm just going to mention those so that you pay attention to, to these terms when you're reading. The right pyramidal cells and tracts. And what these types of cells specifically make up this primary motor cortex, and the axons of those cells go all the way down the spinal cord, like this. And they go all the way out the spinal cord, by the way, to our to our muscles. <clears throat> The, the motor innervation of this area I'll explain this after I write it motor innervation is contra lateral what that means is the left primary motor gyrus controls muscles on the right side of the body and vice versa. So if we're looking at the right side of somebody's brain in my picture right here, these cells, these neurons would control the left side of that person's body. That's what contralateral means and vice versa. The left side, the left primary motor cortex would control the right side of the muscles on the body. There's something called the pre-motor cortex, which is connected to, but somewhat separate from the primary motor cortex. It helps plan the movements that are regulated by the primary motor cortex. So it just helps plan, I'm gonna put fine motor, movements and it's located right here just behind <clears throat> Broca's area is a specific area in the brain it's typically only located on the left in the left hemisphere not on both sides unlike these things which are found on both right and left hemispheres. Broca's area is almost always found in the left hemisphere only. So if I show you where that is, I need to draw the brain going the opposite direction this way. Where this is the front and this is the back. We have this transverse Fisher sort of running this way. Broca's area is located on the left side of the brain, right about here. I'll color it in. This area controls speech articulation. That means muscle movements to find speech control is what that means. How do we know these things? Um, really how the brain areas have been deciphered as to their functions 
largely come from injuries. When somebody has a brain injury in a specific area, what scientists, what neurologists do is they see what the result of that injury is and, and they think, ah, well, that must control that, that function. So Broca's area controls speech articulation. That means that if a person has some sort of damage or injury in that area of, of the brain, they can think of the right word that they want to say, but they have trouble actually saying it. All right, let's move on. Um, we're gonna look at now sensory areas. So I'm gonna layer on another page. <clears throat> and the big major area of the sensory area is the primary somatosensory area. If you have your textbook with you, you can follow along with those diagrams. If you don't, that's okay. I'll show you where it is. So here's our brain. This is the front. This is the back. And here is this sort of this sulcus, this separation between the primary motor, which is in front of this line, so I'm gonna put that in red because I believe that's how your book colors it. So this is the primary motor area that we just finished. And the somatosensory area is behind this sulcus right here. And just like the name described the primary motor cortex, the primary somatosensory area or cortex <clears throat> is what it does is it receives and integrates I'm going to write this cortex it integrates or sorts out I'm going to put integrates receives sensory input from sensory receptors in the skin and skeletal muscles. <clears throat> it also gives us the ability to create spatial discrimination. So what I tell students, this is a very simple, crude explanation of things, but that area in blue, this primary somatosensory area and the primary somatosensory cortex, this area receives and interprets sensory input information. So if you feel something in the, with your sensory receptors, temperature receptors, touch receptors, all that business, when it goes to the brain, the input from the sensory goes to the brain. It has to go through the thalamus, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it ends up in this area. This is where we interpret what we are feeling, what we are sensing, okay? It also gives us the ability for spatial discrimination, meaning a sense of 3D space. Um, so there's also a somatosensory association cortex behind this cortex. So I'm gonna write that out now. Somato sensory association cortex. And that's located, I'll put that in yellow, just as located right here. <clears throat> that's kind of similar to <clears throat> um, 
the premotor cortex on the motor side of things. So this somatosensory association cortex is located behind the primary somatosensory cortex and it helps integrate that sensory input. So specifically, it's an assisting area that integrates sensory input in particular things like temperature pressure from the primary somatosensory cortex to interpret how something feels that's supposed to be on the erase I mean, I'm just making a mess with that. So think of this. When you put your finger <clears throat> when you put your finger on a hard cool surface, how you can sense that it is a hard cool surface is lo largely from what's going on in your somatosensory association cortex. All right, let's move on. Primary, now I'm gonna talk about the primary visual cortex. I'll be short and sweet with, with the rest of these. This is deep in the occipital lobe. That means the very back portion of the brain. So back to my picture up here, if this is front and this is back, the occipital lobe is back here. If this is the cerebellum, I'm gonna make it separate. I'll color the cerebellum in green, just so you, that's cerebellum. What I've circled in black is the occipital lobe. That's where the primary visual cortex is located. And what it does is it sorts out information that comes from our optic nerves and tracks. So this interprets information from the retina of the eye. So it's our special sense organ, the eyes, where we convert light waves into neural impulses, but then those neural impulses have to go all the way back to the primary visual cortex. And that's where we make sense of what those neural impulses are. That's where we say, ah, I'm looking at a tree on a sunny day, or I'm looking at a house or a person or somebody, blah, blah, blah. So that's our interpretation of vision goes on back here in the primary visual cortex, which is in the occipital lobe. Let's layer on. Next is the primary auditory cortex. Unlike the visual business, this makes more sense landmark wise, location wise. This is these, this is located in the temporal lobes on the sides of the brain, both right and left side in the temporal lobes. And this interprets neural information, I just wrote info from vestibulocochlear nerves and these are from the inner ear <clears throat> also interprets equilibrium from the middle ear well it's technically between the middle ear and the and the inner ear interprets our sense of equilibrium. 
from those semicircular canals. So this, I'm just going to write, that interprets our balance, our sense of space, where our head is positioned in space. And this is hearing. So located on the sides of, in the temporal lobes is an area called the primary auditory cortex. And that's what makes sense of, just like with the, uh, the special sense of seeing, we convert sound waves to neural impulses. That goes on in our ear mechanism. But then those nerve impulses get sent to the primary auditory cortex. And that's where we make sense of what we're hearing. Somebody knocking on a door, somebody whistling, a car, engine. That's all done in the primary auditory cortex. Likewise, our sense of balance, where we exist in space, is also interpreted in that primary auditory cortex. <clears throat> then there is an olfactory cortex found in the same area in that temporal lobe. So I'm just going to put also in temporal lobes. And you know what olfaction means. It just interprets what we smell. So there are nerve endings. I'll write sense of smell. There are nerve endings in our nasal cavities and in our mouths that that get stimulated by chemical changes in the air and the atmosphere. And those nerve signals end up going to the primary or the olfactory cortex also in this area. And that's where we make sense of smelling something. Um, memory has a lot to do with that as well. We learn certain smells like what, a, what cookies smell like or what cake smells like or what, um, you know, some fried food smells like or something really obnoxious smells like. But the interpretation is all done in the olfactory cortex. <clears throat> all right, we're getting close to being, I'm just gonna list the gustatory, G-U-S-T-A-T-O-R-Y, the gust, gustatory cortex. <clears throat> This is just a, a region involved in the perceiving taste stimuli, so I'm just going to write sense of taste. That's also highly hooked up to and regulated by memory, and something called the visceral sensory area. They're all located in the same <clears throat> area of the brain. So this one's just located deep to the temporal lobe in something called the insula. It would be like if you could peel off part of the, the temporal lobe and look below it in that auditory cortex. Same with these two. So these two are actually in something called the insula cortex, which is deep to that auditory cortex. So gustatory, just think sense of taste and visceral sensory area. This is the feeling of what's going on inside of us. Visceral means our visceral organs. So think of, it's just perception of, of visceral sensation. Like if you have a stomach ache, um, if you feel like you have uh, to go to the bathroom, things like that. Those feelings are interpreted in this area of the brain. So I'm just going to write visceral sensations. I'll just so you remember, I'll write stomach ache, um, urination. Where you feel those sensations is in the visceral sensory area. All right, how are we doing? Oh, I only have about 10 minutes left. That's all right, I'll get through this. So, 
the next, I'm just going to write terms out and explain them to you. The next term that I want you to know is called lateral position. That just uh, refers to cerebral dominance. I know all of you have heard right side of the brain, left side of the brain. Um, we all have a dominant side of our brains, and that is designated on which side that speech is most dominant in. So in most people, about I think 90% of people, the left hemisphere has what they say has greater control over speech. And so that makes them left hemisphere dominant. So I'm just gonna write the concept of cerebral dominance. There's just a short paragraph about that in your book. So pay attention to lateralization, cerebral dominance. And I'm just gonna put left and right dominance in 90% of the people the left side is the dominant side because of the designation of speech. About 10% of the people on the planet, the right side is their dominant side. The left side tends to be, I'm just gonna put 90% speech. It's also the association with things like uh, math problems, um, sort of what, what we call the hardcore thinking the dominant side, and the right side tends to be, it's dominant in 10% of the people, but in most people it tends to be things like creativity, music, art, <clears throat> things like that, visual, spatial skills, emotion. So just read that quick paragraph. Um, you can, it, just to let you know, for, for my quiz on this section, you can skip the section. I don't like skipping any sections. I hate telling you you don't have to know something about anatomy and physiology, but I get it. You're a student and you want to organize your study. So you can skip the section on the basal nuclei. I'm just not going to get into that. So really quickly before we leave, our last terms. are mostly about the section of the diencephalon that I mentioned. It's, a, it's an area, that word refers to an area deep in the brain. It gets covered up during development with those other structures, the cortex structures sort of filling around it. So we can't see the diencephalon from the surface of the brain. It's an area that's deep in the brain a, these are now specific areas within the diencephalon thalamus. This just sorts and edits. I just say just, it's a very complicated area, but it sorts and edits incoming sensory information. Some people refer to it as the editing center of the brain. So almost all sensory information that comes into the brain has to go through the thalamus and the thalamus then sorts and decides where to send it to the cerebral hemispheres for interpretation. <clears throat> the hypothalamus gets its name because it's located below the thalamus. That's the word hypo. So the hypothalamus is just below, it's an area below the thalamus. This is a very special area. It's the major neuroendocrine gland in the human body. So it's kind of small in size, but it's, I'm gonna put the major, Neuro Some people say it's the major control center of the human body. That's how important it is. So it controls all visceral control, everything inside of us, just about. And it is the most important organ in 
homeostasis, keeping a stable internal environment. I just have to close the window. layer over this. I'm still talking about the hypothalamus. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say review its function. And since you showed up to this meeting, I'll tell you exactly what I mean by this. In your textbook, This is on page 397 that I'm referring to specifically. Under the header of hypothalamus, I want you to read about it, but if you just highlight the bulleted uh, functions of that organ, of that area in the brain, that's what I want you to know. So control of the autonomic nervous system, it initiates physical responses to emotion, so it controls our emotions, it regulates body temperature, when we are hungry, when we are thirsty, um, our sleeping cycles, our sleep-wake wake cycles, and finally, it, it, it controls the entire, just about the entire endocrine system. So I'm gonna stop there, and on Monday, when we meet again, I'll go through these functions really quickly as an intro to get started. So have a great weekend, guys. Um, ask me any questions you'd like. If, if you have any about this lecture, um, that's fine. Or if you have any questions about today's quiz, feel free to do that. Let me cut off my recording here.